Welcome back to Health Reboot, a series of presentations with life-saving information. This tonight is number eight out of eight. We've had eight nights in a row of um, information about how the whole food plant-based diet and the other natural remedies such as plenty of sleep, exercise, sunlight, fresh air, how all these things work together to prevent and reverse disease. As you know, I'm your host, Dr. Linda Carney, and tonight we're talking about painful conditions, headache, pelvic pain, joint pain, back pain, and autoimmune diseases. As always, if you're adopting a whole food plant-based diet for the first time, work carefully with your healthcare provider or physician because your medication doses may need to be adjusted downward, and your healthcare provider is qualified to do this. No treatment relationship is being established. I'm simply offering information. Let's take a review of all the eight lectures that we've had in this wonderful week together. Thank you for those of you who have been coming. Uh, last Saturday, we talked about building your immune system. We showed incredible pictures from the 1918 flu pandemic of how fresh outdoor air and sunlight really um, helped people to fight uh, viruses and the plant-based diet and hydrotherapy, uh, raising the body's temperature with hot water and then uh, cooling it off with a plunge of cold water, how much that stimulated the immune system to help people to um, overcome contagious disease. And on Sunday, we ate more, weighed less, and lived longer. And on Monday, it was diabetes, and we had hormones and women's health and blood pressure and cancer. Last night, it was depression and anxiety, and tonight, autoimmune and painful conditions. And some of you have asked, what books are there with recipes? And this is one of the books with recipes that I had a cover, um, a slide with a cover photo on it, and this is by Dr. Neil Barnard, who wrote his program for reversing diabetes. And even though there's no pictures of the delicious food, the recipes are great. And he gives you the background, basically what I've told you this week, about high-fat diets and animal protein diets cause diabetes type 2, the most common by far of all the types of diabetes that we discussed. But let's get into the painful joints because the more we age, it seems like those aches and pains creep up on us. What is making that elbow hurt? How about those knees? Why are the feet painful and numb? Why so many headaches or back pain? Although Eating animal protein and oil are not the only causes of pain. They are significant factors in painful conditions. How do we know this? By the decrease in pain level when people switch to a whole foods plant-based no oil diet. Why do animal foods and oil cause us to hurt so much? Well, there are many mechanisms, but two of the primary ones are arachidonic acid which is a long chain omega-6 fatty acid, and the omega-6s are inflammatory. The omega-3s, as you may remember, are anti-inflammatory, but unfortunately, they're in the minority, and most of the fats out there are omega-6 fats. And remember that oil and animal protein hurts the inside lining of the arteries, and when the endothelium is hurt and nitric oxide cannot be made, then the artery shrinks down narrow. We call that vasoconstriction. That reduced blood flow means that the inflammatory mediators in your joint or in your brain or in your pelvis, those inflammatory mediators are building up. There's not enough blood flow to carry them away. And there's not enough oxygen to keep them from forming in the first place. This is Tim Kaufman and his friend Adam Sud. And these two gentlemen are plant-based eaters. Every photograph that I've showed you in these series is a plant-based eater. Although not all of them are patients from my former general medical practice in Texas, all of them are people that I have received permission to share their stories and pictures with you of how a plant-based diet helped them to reverse some of their biggest health challenges. And for these guys, they were in pain before they um, adopted a plant-based diet, and now they're not. So I'm uh, grateful that, that these guys have allowed me to share their pictures with you. Painful joints. Now, many of us have had old injuries. Maybe there was an old football injury in high school or college. Maybe there was an accident. Maybe you've had surgery on your back or your knees. Surely those are the causes of our pain, right? Well, even people who've had old injuries that have hurt them for years 
have told me that they have reversed even those old pains by adopting an oil-free, low-fat, plant-based diet of whole unprocessed foods because they're decreasing their intake of arachidonic acid and they're decreasing the injury to the lining of their arteries. They're not vasoconstricting or narrowing their arteries, so they feel better. If we carry excess body fat, then we have body fat cells that are making inflammatory mediators, inflammatory chemicals that cause us to hurt more. Carrying excess body fat increases levels of inflammation and makes us hurt more. Excess body fat also wears out our knees. Knees are kind of like a fulcrum. In other words, the body is shaped kind of like this and goes in at the knees and a little bit out, and there is a torque or a force on the knee that is many, many times greater than you would think. Because when we have just one pound of excess body fat above the knees, it transmits to a force on the knee many times more than that one pound. And if we lose weight, knees breathe a sigh of relief. Knees hurt less on low-fat plant-based diets. This is Shirley. She's just won a door prize at one of my previous support groups back in Texas. She's holding one of my videos and she's scrutinizing it. This was her first time to ever come to a plant-based meeting, her first time that she'd really heard this story. And this is Shirley a year after adopting plants. You see, Shirley was um, convinced by uh, the DVD of mine that she uh, got as a door prize. And by the way, on Monday, uh, on Tuesday night, we're going to be giving away uh, um, door prizes of those, and I hope you'll come. You have your choice of one of six videos. And look at the color of Shirley's dress in the first picture, because here she is in the backyard of my former office. There's the back of me, and I'm encouraging people at the support group, and you can see Shirley there in the front row, and she is, um, that's how she was before she adopted a plant-based diet. So this is a message of hope that we're talking about tonight. As Dr. John McDougall says, the fat that we eat is the fat that we wear. You see, when we eat dietary oil, even a little bit, it's just so easy to store it as body fat. Oil is hiding in baked goods like bread, restaurant foods, crackers, potluck foods, baked goods um, that you can buy from the store or that you can make yourself, and chips, even the ones that say baked. So we need to learn to read ingredient labels and to recognize how they're disguising the words so that you don't realize that sunflower lecithin is sunflower oil. And mono and diglycerides, that's oil. And natural flavoring, that could be anything from oil to sugar to ham. You never know what that is. So. A whole food, plant-based, no oil abbreviation <laughs> leads to lean bodies. There was a meta-analysis. This is an overview of many of the different studies. And they were studying diet styles. And this meta-analysis showed that the oil-free, plant-based diet of whole foods, rich in cooked starches, such as you get from brown rice or oatmeal or sweet potatoes, this led to the best weight loss as maintained over time. Maybe not the fastest, most dramatic weight loss, but for long-term success, the, uh, the tortoise and the hare story, um, the whole food plant-based diet helps you to keep it off the best for long-term. And Mike found this out. He went from 571 pounds before he adopted a plant-based diet, and here he is at 429 pounds. And Mike is a very strong guy. I've seen him pick up an automobile and move it with his bare hands. I've seen him do amazing things. And he's never going to be really skinny, but that's okay. He feels a lot better eating a plant-based diet, and I'm very proud of Mike. Mike, wherever you are, I hope you can see this, thinking about you. All right, painful pelvis. Many women uh, suffer painful pelvis. Maybe it's an ovarian cyst or um, an overgrowth of the inner lining of the uterus that causes heavy bleeding, cramps and clots. Carrying excess body fat causes us to make too much estrogen inside our body 
every body fat cell is not only a factory for inflammation, every body fat cell is also a factory for excess estrogen. And that can contribute to pelvic pain, breast pain also. And headaches. Who knew that we could prevent a lot of headaches if we simply drank our 64 ounces of water every day before 5 p.m., especially if you drink it in between your meals, where you get more out of it than if you drink it with your meals. Now, am I saying that you can't drink any water after 5 p.m.? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you should try really hard to get at least 64 ounces in before 5 p.m., because most of us go, go, go through the day, we forget about drinking our water, and then we try to make up for it in the evening. And what does that cause? That causes disturbed sleep as we get up to the bathroom during the night. So if you can limit the amount of water that you're drinking in the hours before bedtime, you're going to sleep better, less disturbed, and your body is not going to crave as much water in the evenings if you make it a point to get your 64 ounces before 5 p.m. Now, of course, four-year-olds don't need to drink 64 ounces a day, but anybody who's at least five feet tall, 64 ounces is a good place to start. And if you're quite a bit taller and quite a bit heavier than that, you need more than 64 ounces. And when it comes to headaches, getting to sleep before 10 p.m. each night is really going to make a huge difference in that type of pain. But actually, it's not just headache. All the types of pain respond a lot better if you're in bed before 10 p.m. And why is that? Why are two hours of sleep worth more than four hours of sleep afterward? Well, it's the effect on the immune system. The immune system is involved in four main areas that affect our health. There's allergies, whether it's sinus or lungs like asthma, skin itching or skin sores, or gastrointestinal, such as bloating, gas, diarrhea, whether it is um, uh, autoimmune disorders, fighting infection, fighting cancer, the immune system is very, very highly correlated with many diseases either fighting them or causing them. And where is 75% of the immune system located? In the intestines. They're called Peyer's patches. And what we eat comes in from the outside environment. And so the body wants to make sure that nothing bad is going to get into the bloodstream. That's why the immune system is like the soldiers guarding the entrance to the body through the mouth. So what we eat is of primary importance to the immune system. Autoimmune diseases are on the rise. They've risen dramatically since the 1960s. There are many different triggers. Sometimes it's drugs. Many times it's food. Sometimes it's injectables, like whether we're injecting tattoo dye or vaccines or things that we inject. That bypasses the body's, uh, most of the body's immune system and enters right into the bloodstream when you're taking an injection either into your muscle or into an IV. And so we just don't know what all the triggers are, whether it's GMO or pesticides or all the plastics in our environment. We do know, though, that the immune system is under attack. It's under assault. And sometimes the immune system turns around and attacks us, making antibodies against our own tissues. And depending on where those antibodies are targeted, you have various autoimmune disorders, such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Now, those are two separate diseases, but they hit the intestines. Ulcerative colitis is the lower intestine, and Crohn's disease hits the, um, the small intestine. But they're characterized by pain and cramping and diarrhea. Uh, multiple sclerosis targets the nerves of the brain and the peripheral nerves. You see, there's a myelin sheath. This is a fatty coating uh, surrounding the nerves. And antibodies are made in multiple sclerosis attacking that myelin sheath. Therefore, multiple sclerosis is called a demyelinating disease. And many tragic things can happen to a person's health in multiple sclerosis. Psoriasis is a skin disorder with flaking, itching skin. Hyperthyroidism is when the body's thyroid is making too much thyroid hormone. Hypothyroidism is a lack, O for low, hypothyroidism, low thyroid hormone. 
And rheumatoid arthritis is one of the many forms of arthritis, but in rheumatoid, the body is attacking its own joint linings, causing a lot of pain and misshapen joints. Here is beautiful Susie, a patient of mine from my former practice in Texas, and Susie has Crohn's disease. She's given me permission to share with the world her story of Crohn's and remission. And if you go to drcarney.com and you look under the section called Gems, these are my success story patients who have allowed me to share their pictures and their stories on my website. I'd like to talk a little bit about autoimmune disorders. They're really hard to reverse. And so, I haven't told you some of the things in this earlier section of the week that I'm going to tell you now because I don't want to make the plant-based diet too hard to adopt. It's hard enough as it is. Socially, it's hard. And time management-wise, it's hard. And taste bud adapting, it's, it's, it, I have to admit, it's a, it's a learning curve, but it's worth it. And um, the people whose pictures I'm showing you in these presentations have done it, and they think that it was worth every effort that it took. But if you have an autoimmune disorder, like lupus, which was not listed on my uh, list of autoimmune disorders, but that can cause pain. The body's DNA is being attacked, and it causes vasculitis. Itis is a suffix meaning inflammation. And vascular means the arteries and veins. And Lupus can attack anywhere in the body. The brain can have strokes, and the kidneys can fail, leading to dialysis, and the joints can hurt. The pain can migrate from one joint to another. Therefore, when a person is trying to reverse these very serious diseases and other painful conditions, whether it's autoimmune or not, sunshine is essential. We need daily sunshine. Everybody does, but the people suffering autoimmune pain need it more than everybody and sleep. It's essential that the inflammatory mediators become decreased by getting to bed by 10 p.m. Getting adequate sleep is essential when you're suffering pain, when you're trying to fight or reverse autoimmune disease. Exercise is also very, very anti-inflammatory and very important for autoimmune disease. Life has a way of making us feel like we don't have time to get the sunshine, the sleep, the exercise that we need. And that's why I'm mentioning them first, even though they're lowest on the slide. They're just really, really important. And as important as diet is, these other things are also important. Now, why am I talking about nuts, bananas, and beans? They're all healthy foods. They're all plant-based. What's wrong with nuts, bananas, and beans? Nuts, bananas, beans, and certain whole grains have anti-nutrients in them, and they cause pain for some people who have leaky gut. Remember that I said that the immune system is located, 75% of it is located in the intestines. So a leaky gut lets into the bloodstream things that should not be in there. And this can cause our body to attack us and um, create pain and inflammatory mediators. So nuts, be bananas, beans, and certain whole grains like brown rice and oats that everybody else who doesn't have autoimmune disorders or painful disorders, everybody else can eat those just fine. And hey, if you don't have autoimmune, if you're not suffering pain, then you know this section is not for you. This, this slide specifically right here is for the people who are suffering those disabling pains and they want to do something about it. They, they understand that a plant-based diet is the healthiest, but why are they not reversing their lupus? Why is their MS still progressing on worse? Well, for them, they may need to heal their gut with a high percentage of raw food in their diet, lots and lots of greens, the sleep and the sunshine and the exercise, and they may need to cut out nuts, bananas, beans for a little while until they can heal. And when they add them back in, they may need to soak those beans. Now, I think everybody should soak beans before they cook them in their Instant Pot because it really reduces gas and makes it a whole lot easier to digest them. So if you soak your beans for about eight hours or so, or however many hours you have, and then throw away that soaking water, rinse them good, and um, uh, fill, them, fill the pot with new water for the cooking, that's going to help to wash away some of these anti-nutrients in the good whole plant food. Now, sprouting is a process whereby you've got a jar, 
and you've got a lid that looks like a strainer or a sieve. It's kind of mesh. You can buy them in metal or plastic. I prefer metal. Even though metal rusts, plastic is just too plentiful in our world, and it really disrupts our hormones. And so if you can buy a metal, you can even buy six of them for like $10 on, online. And what you do is you rinse your, um, your beans or your whole grains and um, throw out that rinse water, and then you soak them for about eight hours, and then you throw out that water by keeping the sieve lid on. So you turn the jar upside down, and out goes all the water. And then you turn them on a slant. They're not completely upside down. They're kind of on an oblique diagonal. And you kind of spread them out. And you're being very tender and careful with your foods because they're like babies when they're soaked. They're fragile, and you want them to sprout. And when they get the little white threads coming up, like a bean sprout looks, looks like that, um, then they're ready. That takes about three days of you have to rinse them morning, noon, night. It's kind of a lot of work, but it's worth it because they taste better and you're unlocking more nutrients. And the leaky gut needs that to heal. So if you can sprout your beans before you cook them, you're going to have less pain if you've got painful autoimmune uh, disorders. And then whole grains versus pseudo grains. I ask people who are having the most severe pain, the worst lupus, to cut out certain um, whole grains like um, oats, uh, grains um, that have gluten in them like wheat, barley, because people with autoimmune disorders seem very particularly sensitive to gluten. Now, not everybody needs to avoid gluten, but some people, they're just not going to get better any other way. And so, for them, if they cut out oats for a while and use the pseudo grains instead, they may experience less pain. What are the pseudo grains? The pseudo grains are actually seeds, quinoa, buckwheat, amaranth. You may not have heard of these, but um, these are pseudo grains, and people tend to have less pain. Now, there are other things that um, you can cut out, such as nightshades, and some people can cut out nightshades and do better without Irish potatoes, which are also called white potatoes, but it includes Yukon gold potatoes and red potatoes, and cutting out peppers, eggplant, and tomatoes, which are also nightshades. Not everybody has to cut those out, but if you notice that you're having more joint pain the more tomatoes you eat or the more peppers you eat, well, try an elimination diet. Cut those out, see if it makes a difference for you after a few weeks. This movie, whatthehealthfilm.com, shows a lady who at the beginning of her plant-based journey was walking into the facility with a walker. And then, after a couple weeks on the plant-based diet, she's walking without her walker down the sidewalk with one of the staff from the facility. It's just a, such a picture of hope. It just brought the tears to my eyes when I first saw it. So this is a movie that uh, you can find online, or it's on Netflix. This is a movie worth watching. Let's talk a little bit about caffeine and pain, caffeine and autoimmune disorders. Caffeine is a diuretic. That means it tends to push more urine out through the kidneys. This can cause a leaky bladder in some older women. You know that some older women have a hard time after having several babies, or if they're overweight, they have a hard time holding their urine in. If they jump or sneeze, they may lose it. Or they may lose it on the way to the bathroom. They just can't walk fast enough to get there because from the time it's like, oh, I think I need to go to the bathroom, to the time, oops, I'm going to the bathroom, it may be a shortened time frame for those women. They, I have found success in helping women without surgery cutting out the caffeine, and they don't have as much leaky bladder. What, um, B, vitamin B12 is a water-soluble vitamin. So since we're talking about urine, you can urinate away excess amounts of vitamin B12 and become deficient. Now, vitamin B12, as we spoke before, is only made by bacteria. Plants cannot make vitamin B12, and neither can animals. Now, animals' food has dirt, which is bacteria, and so animals can store B12 in the tissues, and then if you eat the tissues, you're getting some B12. But um, there are many more patients who are deficient in B12 who are not plant-based eaters than who are plant-based eaters. And plant-based eaters tend to understand that they need to supplement with B12. If, um, if they can measure their levels and keep them above 400, they're going to do better. And let's talk about caffeine, green tea, and black tea. 
you hear a lot of marketing hype about green tea, it's so great for you, antioxidants. And it's true that green tea has way more antioxidants than black tea. And why is that? Well, let's talk a little bit about green tea. In the green tea plant, the bud and the top two leaves, that's what they harvest. And the field workers take this sharp stick and whack the top of the plant to get that off. And that is similar to as if an animal was eating on the plant. And methyl xanthines, like caffeine, are in the plant to make the plant taste bad to the grazing animals. And so, when they, before they harvest, it, you know, uh, weeks before, if they've whacked the top of the plant, then it grows back with the, um, the bud and the top two leaves with more methyl xanthine trying to keep from getting grazed off because it thinks an animal uh, took it off. And so, if you take green tea, and then you want to turn green tea into black tea, like Lipton's tea, you add bacteria in a big vat and you ferment it. Now the fermentation process is the bacteria eating all the good things out of the tea, the nutrients and the phytochemicals and antioxidants and all the nutrition from the plant is eaten by the bacteria. Caffeine and complex acids remain behind, but very few nutrients are left once um, green tea has been turned into black tea. That's why you hear all the hype. Oh, green tea, it's so good for you. Well, plants are good for you. Green tea is no better than the other plants for you, and you certainly don't need green tea at all because the caffeine in it makes it a bad thing for you instead of a good thing. When the fermentation creates those complex acids, that's what the bacteria leave behind, when the complex acids build up enough, such as vinegar, um, this stops the fermentation because in vinegar, no bacteria can live. Think about it. Vinegar is a component of ketchup and salad dressings, which you can store in the warmest part of your refrigerator. You know, if you had pureed tomato, it would be starting to turn sour, you know, go bad in about five days or maybe less, depending on the heat of your kitchen. But you can put that pureed tomato in the form of ketchup which has vinegar and keep it in your fridge door for like six months and it's still okay because vinegar uh, inhibits bacterial growth because the bacteria cannot live in the vinegar. And so when you're fermenting green tea into black tea and the levels of complex acid rise high enough, it kills off the bacteria and then the fermentation process is done and you're ready to sell the black tea as Lipton's tea. Why is there so much hype about green tea? Why is it found so much favor among the researchers? Well, most research is paid for by the food industry, who's looking for research that will say good things about their product so that you'll buy more of it. So they found out, these were the Chinese researchers that did this. They published this study in 2010 in the journal Epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study of causes. So. They took two groups. They were going to have one group that they fed the green tea to, and then a group that they did not give the green tea to. But in the group that they created to, get, to give the green tea to, they made sure that the people in the group that they were going to give the green tea to were premenopausal. That means they were younger. And they were more likely to have a higher income and a higher educational level and a higher daily dietary intake of fruits and vegetables, which everybody knows is healthy for you, and soy, which is healthy also. So no wonder the group that got the green tea looked better in the health parameters that they measured than the other group. And this is a way that people can lie with statistics because um, studies that are showing an unfavorable outcome for a food those studies don't get published. We call that publication bias. And um, I'm very grateful to Dr. Qi, uh, the Chinese researcher who published this and let us know why. Now let's talk about another methyl xanthine, theobromine and caffeine, which are in cacao. What do we get from cacao? We get cocoa from cacao and it can be made into chocolate. Cacao comes from the carob, I'm um, not the carob bean, cacao comes from the chocolate bean, which is a legume, grows in a pod, and when you get it right out of that pod, it's already 55% of its calories from fat. That's a high fat food 
right out of the starting gate, right there. That's more fat than soy, a soybean has, which is 54%. To make cacao into chocolate, you have to add a few ingredients to overcome the natural properties of the cacao. The cacao is naturally bitter, and so you have to add a lot of sugar. Refined sugar creates painful joints and worsens autoimmune diseases. And cacao is naturally gritty. You want it to have a nice creamy mouthfeel, and the way to get that is to add fat, mostly saturated, which is solid at body temperature, solid enough to plug up your arteries. Saturated fat is very inflammatory, causes a lot of cancer, causes a lot of heart disease, strokes. Uh, saturated fat, not good. So to turn cacao into chocolate, add the sugar, add the fat, and if you want to make it the most addictive of all, add the milk chocolate because the casein triggers our pleasure center into bliss. And there you have the quadruple whammy of milk chocolate. It's got four addicting substances in it. The caffeine and theobromine, which are the methylxanthines that hit the pleasure center and give us a little release of dopamine, serotonin, the feel-good chemicals when we eat it. it we taste it on our tongue and instantly the, the signal goes to the brain, hey, we gotta have more of that right now. So the caffeine and the theobromine, they're addicting. And then the sugar, that's addicting because it, what it does to the pleasure center. And then the fat, that's addicting what it does to the pleasure center. And the casein, the quadruple whammy of milk chocolate's addicting properties. So why are the theobromines and caffeines in the plant anyway? Remember we talked about it with green tea? It's about grazing and keeping the plant protected from overgrazing. So in Africa, the largest ungulate, which is an, an, an antelope type of an animal or a deer type of an animal, the largest ungulate is the eland. And the eland likes to graze on the acacia tree leaves. So as the eland is eating the leaves, the tree senses that the leaves are being torn. And so it sends out a pheromone. What's a pheromone? It is a wind-borne scent chemical that the other leaves can sense. And so as the tree puts out this uh, scent chemical, the pheromone, and says, hey, something is eating on our leaves, we've got to raise the level of bitter astringent methylxanthines in the leaves to get this eland to have a bad taste in his mouth so he'll stop eating. And this wind-borne chemical goes to the leaves of the whole tree and the leaves of the next door acacia tree so that the eland, the next time he takes a bite, ooh, it's astringent because the pheromone gave the leaves the signal to raise the level of caffeine and theobromine in the leaves. So the eland has to, oh man, get that taste out of his mouth. He has to wander down about 50 meters to the next tree that was so far away that the windborne chemical didn't go there yet. It didn't, it didn't get that far. So they haven't gotten the memo and they don't have the high levels of the methylxanthines like caffeine and theobromine. And they're not astringent, their leaves are sweet. So then he goes down and he keeps grazing on the trees down the line. And this bitter alkaloid is in the plant to prevent overgrazing. That's what caffeine is in the plants for. Now, switching gears a little bit, the more dietary fat, the more cancer. The more we eat oils and fats, the more cancer. And this is a ranking of countries, with Thailand down around 10% of the diet's calories coming from fat. And the Netherlands, way high in fat, they eat a lot of cheese there, and cheese is uh, the, the biggest uh, contributor of saturated fat to the American diet. And so, they are ranked in terms of their breast cancer cases. And I'm grateful to Canadian researcher, Dr. Ken Carroll, for putting this forth. And then Dr. T. Colin Campbell looked at Ansel Key's data from heart disease, and he said the more animal protein, the more cancer. Again, down at Thailand, around 5% animal protein. And then up to the Netherlands, um, much more animal protein. And the more animal protein in the diet, the more cancer interesting 5% um, animal protein. Breast milk has the animal protein of the mother in it, but it's down around 5 6%, and it's perfect for growing a baby human being and, and getting it to you know get quite a bit bigger than it was when it came out. 
On my website, you'll, found, you'll find many interesting facts like this. There are research studies abstracted there, more than 1,300 of them. Uh, actually, it's, it's more like 1,800 now. And, um, and you'll find out that people who have a 34% lower risk of developing diabetes are people who eat a plant-based diet, according to the School of Public Health at Harvard, who published this after surveying 200,000 health professionals for more than 20 years. And those who ate a plant-based diet had a 34% lower risk of developing diabetes. So if you're looking for a place to get the um, evidence of, of what I'm saying, it's on my website and it's there free. You can sign up for a free account at drcarney.com. If you've got some before and after pictures that you would like to be on drcarney.com, please, there's a contact us button on drcarney.com and you can um, have your story to inspire the world too. Oil damages the endothelial cells. Remember that we talked this week that within 20 minutes of eating oil, the blood flow was decreased 31% after eating olive oil and stayed restricted for four hours. That promotes inflammation and pain. So the reason why I'm, um, forgive me, belaboring the point, mentioning it again, is people with uh, autoimmune diseases are probably not going to be able to reverse it if they're continuing to eat oils even if they eat um, no animal products. But whole foods are anti-inflammatory. Antioxidants are found only in plants. Fiber is found only in plants, and both of those are anti-inflammatory. Low-fat, fiber-intact plant foods do not hurt the endothelial cells. This is the before and after pictures of Adam Sud that I showed you. Um, his father is um, one of the chief executives of Whole Foods Market, and um, Adam Sud was um, addicted to fast food, and now he's not. He's free, and he goes around the country helping people to reverse type 2 diabetes like he did, as well as his other diseases he reversed. Oil promotes inflammation by boosting levels of oxidized LDL cholesterol, L for lousy, and LDL cholesterol is atherogenic. That means it plugs up your arteries, clogs them up. Um, oil raises inflammatory markers in the blood like C-reactive protein, and as you know, it hurts the endothelium, and that creates a lot of pain. How does it exactly create pain? The vegetable oils um, all create the arachidonic acid pathways in the body, and here we have one of the four is clastic classic prostaglandins. This is what ibuprofen and naproxen were made to combat. This is the pain of menstrual cramps. That's a classic, classic prostaglandin-mediated inflammatory pain. Then there's the thromboxanes. They cause blood clotting, heart attacks, and strokes. Vegetable oils do that. Then there's the prostacyclines, highly active in rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune arthritis of the body making antibodies to attack its own lining of its joints. The leukotrienes are active in asthma, and it was because of giving up oil, as well as giving up meat, dairy, and eggs, that I reversed my asthma and no longer have it, and no longer have to take leukotriene, mo leukotriene modulators like Montelukast. Oil promotes inflammation such as arthritis, cataracts, autoimmune disease, because all the plant-based oils raise the level of arachidonic acid. And there are studies published in 1994, 1999, and 2012 corroborating that data. Let's talk about cancer, which is one of the functions of the immune system. Acrylamides are found in heated oil. The International Agency for Research on Cancer calls acrylamides, quote, a probable human carcinogen. Did you know, though, that some potato chips contain acrylamide in levels 900 times over the legal limit? Now, wait a minute. Wouldn't you think that chips should carry a warning label about causing cancer? Well, so did the state of California. They sued chip maker Frito-Lay, and that was in 2005, and they State of California sued Frito-Lay for failing to warn consumers about the risks of acrylamide. So they wrangled and finagled and finally reached a settlement in 2008 where they lowered the uh, law's um, parts per billion to avoid requiring a cancer-causing label. 
So chips still don't carry a cancer-causing label because, you know, money talks and laws can be changed and yeah, okay. Baked chips, which are regarded as healthier but really are not, may contain more than three times the level of acrylamide as regular chips according to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration data, the FDA. Wow. They, the food industry just lies a lot, doesn't it? Meat promotes brain cancer through N-nitroso compounds from nitrates. This has also been called a probable human carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Nitroso compounds are found in tobacco smoke, cosmetics, and cured meats like pepperoni, salami, and chorizo. Does oil have saturated fat? All the oils are a mixture of saturated fats, monounsaturated fats, and polyunsaturated fatty acids, which uh, are abbreviated on this slide, PUFAs. Polyunsaturated fatty acids are um, vegetable oil kind of fat. Now, there's 14% of the calories in olive oil that come from saturated fat. And yet, the American Heart Association recommends that we limit our intake of saturated fat to no more than 7% of calories. And many dietitians say that 5% is even better if you want less disease. So, let's do a little math. How bad is a little bit of oil? Olive oil, like all oils, contains 40 calories per teaspoon. Not a big tablespoon, a teaspoon. Now contrast that with white sugar which contains 16 calories, not 40, per teaspoon. And the reason for this is that fat contains nine calories per gram of food, and carbohydrate, like sugar, contains four calories per gram of food. So picture in my hand a half cup ser serving of vegetables, 25 calories in those veggies. Now, add just one teaspoon of oil, that's 40 calories, 25, plus 40, now you've got 65 calories in my serving of veggies. What this means is that 62% of the calories in my serving now come from the worst fat of all, oil. And 10% of it is now saturated fat, even though the American Heart Association recommends that we get no more than 7% of fat. Now, imagine if this were coconut oil, the worst oil of all, which has more than 90% of its calories from saturated fat. Coconut oil has more saturated fat than lard. Imagine how far above the American Heart Association guidelines that is. And 30% of the coconut oil calories are from the worst saturated fats. So if you're trying to outrun pain and autoimmune disease, don't use coconut oil or olive oil. Clean up America's dietary oil spill. In 1909, a long time ago, Americans ate 13 grams per day of oil. But in 2005, Americans ate 38 grams per day of oil. From 13 to 38, that's a big jump. And most of the oil was omega-6 fatty acids, which are inflammatory. Polyunsaturated fatty acids promote premature aging, wrinkling of your skin via cell oxidation, which we call oxidative stress. One time, a lady came up to me after a lecture, and she said, and this was very kind of her, I'm not trying to brag, but she says, okay, okay, doctor, if I give up oil, can I have your skin? And it's not that um, this skin has only oil, you know, lack of oil to thank for, you know, age 61 with as few wrinkles as I have. I, mean, I have plenty of wrinkles, but hey, I'll, I'll take my face um, compared to others. But I mean, there's genetics and, and other exposures that play into that, but it's amazing how when people take their before and after pictures, even the texture of their skin clears up a little better. So there are many different reasons why oil is unhealthy. No fiber, too dense in calories. It's just fat. There's no protein or carbohydrate. And remember that carbohydrate is the brain's only fuel. It's so easily stored as adipose tissue. From the lips to the hips, that's where the olive oil or coconut oil goes. And it promotes acid reflux. It hurts the arteries, the endothelial cells. It promotes cancer by raising estrogens. It promotes inflammation for autoimmune diseases and rotator cuff tears and um, Achilles tendon and plantar fasciitis. It's atherogenic, raising your cholesterol levels. And it's addicting, as if we needed more food cravings. So is there portion control on the plant-based diet? 
The only portions that need to be controlled are foods that are higher in calorie concentration. Now, the seeds that are highest in omega-3 are flax and chia. So if you're going to eat some high-fat foods and you have autoimmune disease, make it flax and chia because they've got anti-inflammatory omega-3, and that's much better for you than some other types of nuts and seeds. Um, you may need to limit your portions of soy if you have a lot of weight to lose or a lot of pain to outrun. You may need to limit foods made from flour, even if the flour is a whole grain um, product. You may need to limit dried fruit and avocado, nuts and olives, because these are higher in fat. But if you're not trying to lose weight and you're not in pain, then you, know, you don't have to be as strict on this. So you can freely eat the green vegetables and non-starchy vegetables. And eating green several times a day when you're fighting autoimmune disease has been shown to really help. Also, focusing on fruits grown in the north of the United States, they're going to reverse diseases better, especially overweight and diabetes. So what fruits are grown in the north of the United States? Pears, apples, cherries, plums, berries. It's not that these fruits aren't grown in other parts you know, of the country, but they're um, more likely to reverse disease better than the tropical fruits. It's not that I have anything against tropical fruits. I love the taste of mango, papaya, uh, pineapple, orange, banana. But when it comes to reversing the hardest diseases to reverse and the most painful conditions and diabetes and overweight, you may have better luck with the northern fruits than with the tropical fruits. Okay, getting two hours of sleep before midnight is essential treatment for um, painful conditions and autoimmune. This is because it regulates the levels of hormones ghrelin and leptin, which have to do with how much body fat we store and how much appetite we have. Getting to bed regularly is important. If you're um, staying up late on the weekends, it's not as good for you if you know trying to sleep in and make it up. You're not going to have the same amount of health. Some, some scientists believe that the night's early hours of sleep, like the hours of sleep from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., repair the body. And then after that, the later hours of sleep in the night repair the mind. REM sleep, very important for repair of the memory and the mind. However, in trying to get our two hours of sleep before midnight, we need to understand that when you drink caffeine, even if you're just drinking it in the morning, even if it's just one cup or half calf or decaf, which still has some caffeine, it can disturb your sleep. The sleep patterns have been um, noted by the researchers to be disturbed up to two weeks later. Wow, that's not even fair, is it? Alcohol interferes with sound sleep, and I know that doesn't seem to make sense on the surface of it. Many people take a drink of alcohol because they think it makes them fall asleep better. And in the short term, yes, they do fall asleep better, but as alcohol gets metabolized away, aldehydes are the byproduct of alcohol metabolism. And aldehydes wake you up with more alertness. And you may not be awake enough to realize that you're not in the deep restorative stage of sleep, you're just in the fitful tossing and turning stage of sleep, but it's still not deep restorative sleep that helps you to repair your old injuries, um, keep your memory, and lose belly fat. Regular exercise improves sleep, but just be careful not to exercise vigorously in the two hours before bedtime. So how to saute without oil. You want to have your onions and garlic in your veggies and, and your other dishes they can be sauteed without oil by using a small amount of water or veggie broth. You can heat up the skillet or pan, just to heat it up enough so that a drop of water will dance across the surface. Pour a small amount of water into the pan. If you pour too much, you're gonna steam the veggies. And hey, nothing wrong with steamed veggies, but if saute is the look you're going for, use a small amount, just enough to break the surface tension. Throw in the veggies and stir constantly with your spatula. If the veggies get dry, add a little more liquid. Just not enough, you want just enough to not let the veggies burn. As the brown starts um, coming, you know, sticking to the pan, scrape that brown off into the veggies and you'll have your browned onions in no time. And so, do what the plant-based athletes do. The long distance runners and the um, world famous boxers and the soccer players, they ate plants and they found better athletic endurance. Now, picture a chair. You want to sit down on it, but there are 10 thumbtacks resting point up on your chair, on the chair where you were planning to sit down. What do the th 10 thumbtacks represent on the chair? 
they could represent habits that hurt our health. Nicotine, alcohol, meats, and all the animal flesh, including fish, which has been proven to hurt our health and increase the risk for cancer. Caffeine, eggs, dairy products, refined sugar, which is often hidden in foods. Other habits like not getting to bed before 10 p.m. and not getting enough exercise or stretching and not drinking enough water. Let's take away those habits. Let's take away the thumbtacks on the chair we're about to sit down. What if you took away nine of the 10? Change is difficult, so much work. Habits are hard to break. Hey doc, I did 90% change. Almost everything has gone out of my life. Why can I still not outrun my lupus or whatever it is that you're trying to reverse? What if you're still eating the hidden vegetable oils that are found in Fritos? If you sat down on one after you took away nine, would it still hurt? It would, wouldn't it? So if you had 10 thumbtacks resting point up on your chair, the chair you're planning to sit down this year, and if you just had one, this is why I'm so idealistic. I hold up a high standard for you because some things aren't going to cure any other way. And of all the lectures that I have um, said this week, this is the one, the autoimmune diseases and the painful conditions. Sometimes the older you get, you're just not going to outrun those things unless you go strict with yourself. And that's why I have to be strict with myself about no oil because I don't want the asthma to come back. Some remedies got to go all the way to keep you feeling your best and to help you reach your goals. And if people change for just a little while, the changes may not be enough. They may not go long enough to undo the damage of past years. There's four ways you need to know to eat without oil. Salad dressings can be made from blended tofu in the blender. You can blend nuts or seeds, but you can go low fat too. You can blend up cooked potato. If you blend up cooked potato and cooked carrot, it turns uh, into a look like cheddar cheese. And, uh, and that can be a very delicious kind of a cheesy sauce. Um, you can blend up cooked brown rice, cooked oatmeal. There's a lot of things that you can blend up for sauces and, and put all your seasonings in there and make it taste good. To saute onions, you just saw how you can do that with water or veggie broth. Baked goods, if you use, um, let's say cup for cup, if, you, if, if your recipe calls for half a cup of oil, you can use half a cup of uh, mashed banana or um, applesauce and that can um, make your baked goods moist. And fried foods, you can use an air fryer with a piece of parchment paper that has the perforations in it so the air can get through so things won't stick and you can get crispy things that are just delicious. God can empower us to change. I had to pray about these things and I still have to pray about it because we can't really do anything good without God's power, whether we know that it's God giving us the power or not. And look for oil-free plant-based recipes online and join Facebook groups like McDougal Friends and read books about it um, and watch films like What the Health. Here to talk to us about what the Bible says about disease is Pastor Michael Wolford. Let's bring him up. <laughs> Pastor Wolford says that God cares about our health, including our mental health and spiritual health and our physical health. And so, Pastor Wolford, what does the Bible say about God caring about our diseases. Well, Dr. Uh, Linda, I really like this verse. I've read this verse many times, and it's become one of my favorite verses. And maybe you'll see why when we read it. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth, all thy diseases. I would invite you sometime to read the rest of that chapter. The whole chapter is amazing. It even says that he renews your youth. And uh, it's an amazing thing to read. When you think about this part, about forgiving all your iniquities, we had looked a few nights ago, a couple of times, at the fact that just like God has laws in the Bible, and he has the Ten Commandments in the Bible, God also has laws written on every cell of your body. And when you break God's spiritual laws, there's consequences. And there's guilt. Guilt is not just a complex. Guilt is something that happens when you break God's law. And uh, when you damage your body, there's consequences that are very real. But the good news is 
that God is ready to help us. He's ready to forgive our iniquities. When we ask forgiveness and we repent and we say, God, help me to turn, then God is ready to forgive our iniquities, all of them. And God is ready to heal our diseases, all of them. As you were talking about those uh, nine tacks, I was thinking about the Ten Commandments. You know, if there's one of those commandments that we just break on purpose, it's going to cause hurt. It's going to cause serious damage. It's going to cause pain. And, uh, and the same in the health area. If there's something that we know is damaging, it's going to cause damage. You know, <laughs> the Bible says, don't be mocked. It says, don't be deceived, and, and God is not mocked. What you sow, you will reap. There's a law and effect principle. But God has something called forgiveness. And his forgiveness is powerful. I want you to think for a moment as we're at the end of this powerful class tonight, I want you to think about something, about how powerful forgiveness is, God's forgiveness. Because God's forgiveness is what accomplishes real change in our lives and real victory, so we turn from the thing that's damaging us. But God's forgiveness is two-way. It's not only powerful to heal us, but when we forgive others, it's very powerful to forgive us and sometimes them unless they don't want that forgiveness. Forgiveness is so powerful in healing, healing you and healing other people. If you don't forgive, the Bible is very clear what happens, but it's not just a spiritual block, it is a physical block. When people don't forgive, it actually lowers the epinephrine or the serotonin in the brain and it actually begins to bring people down into depression. When you forgive, actually those chemicals in your brain come back up. But it's more than that. The Holy Spirit enters in a powerful way in your life to bring healing. So God's forgiveness goes two directions. He forgives you, but he helps you forgive others. Oh, when you do that, there's so much health restoring in it. He forgives all your iniquities and helps you to forgive all those that have sinned against you. And he heals all of your diseases. There's a lot of power there. And it all comes from God. Thank you, Pastor Walker. I'm looking forward to the Tuesday night support group with Bible Study Hope. All right. Remember we talked about the blue zones where people live to be 100 years old? And there's a common factor among the blue zones, and that's social support. And those um, in the Sardinia and the Okinawa blue zones are adopting Western diets and thus those blue zones are shrinking. There's only one blue zone in Loma Linda, California that's not shrinking, and um, there are a lot of people who eat a plant-based diet there. We admitted last night that there are social challenges for plant-based eaters. Two big hurdles are time management and other social challenges such as feeling all alone in this diet, because the world really isn't set up to sell you food that's uh, this way. And risking social rejection, especially as we head into the holidays. That's why we're especially glad that we have um, the support groups uh, ongoing Monday and Tuesday night as we go through the holidays. Loved ones can be angry that we don't meet their expectations when it comes to food. And so I hope that you'll come on Monday night so that you can taste the cookies. And on Tuesday night so you can win the door prizes for uh, some of my videos and study the Bible with uh, Pastor Wolford and me. We're looking forward to that with you. And um, we're going to, on Monday nights, uh, talk more about how to cook for autoimmune, autoimmune diseases and pain, osteoporosis or cancer, high blood pressure, asthma, and of course, overweight. And you can find like-minded friends in these support groups, taste new recipes, learn the supporting science, and even find potential mates if that's what you're looking for. And you can find um, time for your taste buds to neuroadapt to the new tastes and take heart because your taste buds will adapt and the foods that are foreign and um, feeling deprivational right now will become um, delicious to you after um, a few months of eating them and come on Tuesday night so that people can have power to kick caffeine and beat insomnia and learn why evil exists and to study what God is doing in our lives what he's doing about the problem of evil and suffering and and what he's doing to help us through our daily challenges and remember that there are videos that you can, um, you can buy or, stream or rent them online, but these are the videos that I will be um, 
giving away at the um, support group. And once again, a recap of what we came through this week. Remember that they're on YouTube if you'd like to see them. And when I get back home to Amity uh, next week, I will be remaking some of them that uh, had challenges with the sound, and we're going to get some good copies up there so that you'll have the whole series that you can watch. Remember to go to healthreboot.com and click on the website to enter in your questions. And I have uh, gratitude towards all the researchers and scientists who have published and uh, made this information available to me so that I could bring it to you. I hope you'll bring your friends and family to the support groups on Monday and Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. We'll see you here this Monday night, the 18th. Thank you so much for your kind attention.